If I had to guess a couple of months ago which company would release the most powerful legal paddle on the market, honestly, Gearbox would have never entered my mind. Gearbox has always been at the leading edge of quality and innovation, but raw power has never really been their thing. If I had to come up with an honest motto for Gearbox up to now, it would have been built like a truck, hits like a Prius. Well, all of that changes right now. The Gearbox Pro Series does not come cheap. It enters the market as the most expensive paddle behind the Selkirk Labs options at $275. So let me break this paddle down and present all the performance metrics so that you can make an informed decision about whether or not you want to shell out that kind of cash for the latest paddle in Gearbox's lineup. The Pro Series is offered in two models, power and control. And each model has two shapes, elongated and a hybrid shape that they're calling Fusion. The elongated models measure 16.5 inches long by 7.4 inches wide. The Fusion model is shorter, coming in at 16 inches even. But interestingly, they're the same width, 7.4 inches. Usually shorter paddles are also wider, but Gearbox made a conscious decision to keep the Fusion the same width as the elongated. I spoke with the founder and CEO of Gearbox, Rafael Filippini, about this and many other things. And he said that keeping the Fusion narrow helps with maneuverability. In the same way that reducing the length of the paddle increases maneuverability by reducing swing weight, keeping the paddle more narrow also increases twisting maneuverability by reducing twist weight. So think about roll volleys. You not only have to swing the paddle, but you also have to twist it. Now, you might be thinking, well, isn't a larger twist weight good because it means a bigger sweet spot? The two are definitely correlated, but it's not a causal relationship. I'll get into the sweet spot more later, but for now, just know that these paddles all have very large sweet spots, even with their low twist weights. Here's another interesting thing. All four of these paddles weigh the same, 8.0 ounces. My Pro Control elongated paddle was ever so slightly heavier than the others at 8.1 ounces, but all the others were 8.0 ounces on the nose. This despite the fact that the Fusion model has smaller dimensions and a smaller surface area. This was also intentional. The reason behind this has to do with the density of carbon fiber plies used in the layup of the paddle. So the Fusion has the same layup design as the elongated, but the Fusion has denser carbon fiber layers. Why would they do this? Because they wanted the player to feel comfortable going back and forth from the elongated option to the Fusion. For example, you could use the elongated paddle for singles and then switch back to the Fusion for doubles without there being too much of an adjustment. The swing weights are different though. The elongated paddles measure between 120 and 122, and the Fusion paddles have swing weights of between 112 and 115. So the swing weight of the elongated varieties falls at the 67th percentile in my database, and the hybrid swing weight falls at the 40th percentile. These are standard ranges for elongated and hybrid paddle shapes, so the elongated models will feel like swinging a Legacy Pro, Carbon One X, and Pickleball Apes Pro Line Energy. And the Fusion models will feel like a 6-0 Double Black Diamond, Rhombus Nova R1, and Vatic Flash. The twist weight is very low for both of these paddles. The Fusion varieties have a twist weight of 5.14, and the elongated paddles come in at 5.22. That equates to only the second percentile for the Fusion and the eighth percentile for the elongated. So 98% of the paddles in my database have a higher twist weight than the Fusion, and 92% have a higher twist weight than the Elongated. Generally, the wider a paddle is, the higher the twist weight. And generally, the higher the twist weight, the wider the sweet spot. But that's not the case with these paddles, which all have very large sweet spots. More on this later. A new metric that I've been gathering data on is balance point. It's a measurement that's commonly used in tennis, but so far hasn't been widely used in pickleball. The balance point indicates how weight is distributed throughout the length of the paddle. I'm using three categories, head light, equal balance, and head heavy. Head light paddles are generally more maneuverable and less sluggish, translating into better hand speed. Head heavy paddles are generally more powerful with less hand speed and maneuverability, and equal balance falls between these two. Both Gearbox models, the power and control, and both varieties, the elongated and fusion, 
hover around the boundary between equal balance and head heavy, slightly trending in the direction of head heavy. This makes sense given that all of these paddles have good power. And spoiler alert, the power models actually have ridiculous power. You also have to consider swing weight when discussing balance point. A high swing weight and a head heavy balance point would result in a sluggish paddle with poor hand speed. But the swing weights for the elongated and fusion varieties are both standard for elongated and hybrid paddles. So the balance point hovering around the boundary between equal balance and head heavy is right where it should be if you wanna maximize your power while retaining good maneuverability and hand speed. I'll give you some tips later for using lead tape to lower the balance point and provide more stability. Okay, let's move on to how this thing was built and some of the theory behind its construction. Fair warning, this section will probably only appeal to true paddle nerds. So if that's not you, feel free to jump to the next section and hit the performance link in the description box below. There's so much technology going into this paddle that it could fill a thesis. So I'll try to keep this section as brief as possible while hitting all of the key points. Like I said, I had a long discussion with the founder of Gearbox, Raphael, and he provided a lot of information about the inner workings of the Pro line. Coincidentally, this is the second video in a series I'm making about paddles using non-traditional core types. As most of us know already, the Gearbox SST core is unlike any other on the market. Instead of using honeycomb polypropylene, the Gearbox SST core uses parallel carbon fiber ribs oriented along the paddle's long axis. This animation from Gearbox does a nice job of showing how this works. And this part isn't new for Gearbox. They've been doing it for a while now. But Gearbox did make some significant changes to the Pro Series compared to all of their previous paddles. As you can see from this spec sheet, there's a lot of terminology and jargon. I'll try to explain the key concepts, what was changed, and why it matters without getting too bogged down into the jargon. One of the main differences is that the ribs are now segmented along their length rather than the solid ribs seen in earlier paddles. And these segments are separated from one another by a gap. The only thing holding these segments together is their adhesion to the face sheets on both sides of the paddle, which takes place during the curing process. So the theory behind this is that each one of these segments serves as its own micro core within the paddle. A good analogy to use here is the type of suspension in a car or truck. Think about how a solid axle on a truck works. Each wheel on either side of the axle moves in an equal and opposite way. So if one wheel goes down into a pothole, the other wheel goes up. But the segmented ribs in the gearbox core act more like independent suspension, where if one wheel drops into a pothole, the opposite wheel is not affected. So compared to their earlier SST cores where the entire length of the paddle was affected by a ball striking the surface, this new design breaks up the carbon fiber ribs so that only the area of the paddle in the immediate vicinity of the striking zone absorbs and rebounds the ball. Here's another new aspect of this technology. Since each rib segment is structurally sound and doesn't compress on just one side or the other, like polypropylene or EVA foam, when a ball hits one surface, the deflection also carries through to the opposite face because that carbon fiber rib itself is not kind of squishing inward. In other words, one side of the paddle face deflects inward and the opposite face deflects outward, so that energy is then returned into the ball's rebound. This is different from how standard cores work, so polypropylene or EVA foam, where primarily only one side of the paddle deflects the side being impacted by the ball, and then rebounds the ball. But when a ball hits one of these Gearbox Pro paddles, the entire segment of carbon fiber ribbing deflects independently from other ribs so that both faces of the paddle deflect in parallel. So this is how Raphael from Gearbox explained it to me. So if my hand is a paddle face, and my wrist is the neck, and my forearm is the handle, this is how a normal paddle deflects a ball. And this is how the Gearbox Pro Series deflects a ball. So the micro cores working independently from one another are supposedly enhancing the effectiveness of surface deflection and dwell time. If I understand the theory behind this correctly, this type of deflection where both the striking surface and the opposite surface are deflecting and rebounding the ball will generate more velocity, mostly because of two things. 
Number one, there's now a more localized spot of deflection instead of that energy being deflected across the entire surface of the paddle. And as a side note, I'd say that this is only in comparison to the older gearbox models using SST cores and could explain why they were generally lacking in power. And then number two, because both sides of the paddle are now deflecting in concert with each other, the rebound effect is now tapping into more energy. So you get not only energy return from the surface layers being impacted by the ball and the core materials directly beneath, but also from the surface layers on the opposite side of the paddle. So again, more things are contributing to the energy output, which seems to be the special sauce on this paddle that separates it from other brands. But the proof is in the pudding, so let's put this theory to test and see how these paddles actually perform. One of the things I'm excited about with this paddle is that they're using a peel ply texture, otherwise known as raw carbon fiber. Besides their older GBX paddle, Gearbox has mostly been using grit texture on their paddles. And peel ply textures just seem to be a better option overall for higher spin and durability. Under a microscope, you can see that the surface texture is similar to the standard rougher peel ply texture seen on other paddles, but it's slightly different. It's a real nice looking texture, kind of very standardized, and it just looks more solid than what we've seen before. This probably has to do with the way the peel ply is cured. Gearbox uses a longer curing period with more cycles of heat and pressure, which helps to fill in all of the peel ply cavities evenly. And this is visible in this microscopic image. This more elaborate curing method together with the high quality epoxy used is supposed to result in a more durable face that won't wear down as quickly as most other raw carbon fiber paddles. I'll report back on this in a few weeks to see if I do notice a difference in wear patterns. All of these paddles get great spin. Average RPM for my tests for all four of the ProLine paddles came in between 2000 to 2100 RPM, placing them in the top tier spin category. One thing to note is that you can close your paddle face more on this paddle to produce more top spin without the ball sliding across the face. So you can use an Eastern grip or even move it over to a semi Western grip to put more spin on the ball. Another thing to note here is that Torre carbon fiber is used throughout the paddle, not only on the surface layers, but also inside the SST core. The more I have discussions with Paddle engineers, the more I'm coming to the conclusion that Torre and other name brand carbon fiber are in fact better than generic, but not all paddles using Torre carbon fiber are equal. There are many things going into a paddle's manufacture that affect its overall performance and durability, and the quality of the carbon fiber is just one of them. So does the Pro Series measure up for power and pop? Well, let's just say that the Pro Series is light years ahead of anything else that Gearbox has released for both of these metrics. If you look at this power rating chart, which shows an average for serve speed, you have to go way down to the bottom of the chart to find any Gearbox paddles up to now. The CX-11 took the bottom spot by a good margin, and the CX-14 Ultimate, which was advertised as a power model, isn't much further up the list. Now, this chart does not show the pro line paddles yet, but take a look at the top of the chart. The top five most powerful paddles are all EVA foam paddles. So the Diadem Vice and all of Rhombus's EVA paddles. These are all just concept paddles. They're not USAP approved because they don't pass deflection tests. And most people agree that they're just too powerful and shouldn't be legal. And take a look at that gap between the EVA foam paddles and the most powerful legal paddles. It's pretty substantial. All of the top performing paddles max out around 55 miles per hour. And take a look at the top seven paddles here at 55 miles per hour and above. They're all tightly grouped and are separated by just one or two tenths of a point. Now look at what happens when you add the Pro Series to this chart. That's right, they all filled in the gap between the USAP approved paddles and the EVA foam paddles. Even the control model paddles beat all other legal paddles in terms of power and the power models both come in above 57 miles per hour within just one mile per hour of EVA foam paddles. So theory confirmed, these paddles take the crown for the most powerful USP approved options on the market. What about pop? So again, pop refers to the velocity of the ball returned from short strokes like punch volleys of the kitchen during hand exchanges, instead of the full swing you take on power shots. And this is actually where most people notice a difference in a paddle. 
I think because most battles on a pickleball court happen at the kitchen where you're using these short strokes during a firefight. For example, the Prokenix Black Ace is a notoriously poppy paddle, and in fact, it does top my charts for pop. But pop doesn't always correlate with power. For example, going back to the power chart, the Black Ace is only middle of the pack for power. In fact, it's rare for a paddle to have both top tier power and pop. But the Gearbox Pro Series paddles do in fact have both top tier power and pop. The Pro models edged out the Selkirk Power Air and are now second only to the Black Ace for pop. The control models are only slightly lower than that on the chart coming in at sixth and ninth place. Okay, so now we know that these paddles hit like a truck, have great spin, and how they measure up with swing weight, twist weight, and balance point. But how does everything come together during gameplay? As the metrics suggest, this paddle is in a category of its own for power. And I'm talking about both the control and the power versions. The control paddles are slightly more conservative, but they still hit harder than any legal paddle on the market. And the power paddles top my speed charts by a good margin for USAP approved paddles and are actually closer in speed to EVA foam paddles than they are to any of the legal paddles. Pop is also top tier and the punch volley speed for power versions are only second to the Pro Kinex Black Ace. The control versions also get top tier pop and are just a few spots down on the list for punch volley speed. The sweet spot on these paddles is also very good, which is surprising given the very small twist weight readings for all of these paddles. It has something to do with the segmented carbon fiber ribs in the core providing the equivalent of independent suspension. I'm not sure exactly how it works, but these things have big sweet spots, both the elongated and fusion versions. The only thing I didn't care for about the feel of the sweet spot in their stock form was a bit of unpleasant feedback when hitting the ball off center and further down the face, closer to the neck. So I added lead tape to the paddle edges at four o'clock and eight o'clock, which fixed the problem on both the hybrid and elongated versions. I added half an ounce of lead tape, so a quarter ounce to each side, and here's how that affected the swing weight and twist weight. For elongated versions, swing weight was increased four points, going from 120 to 124, and twist weight increased a full point, going from 5.2 to 6.3. For the Fusion versions, swing weight increased by two points, going from 112 to 114, and twist weight increased by more than one point, from 5.14 to 6.45. So that's a significant jump in twist weight, while swing weight didn't increase all that much, especially for the Fusion version. I'd say that adding lead tape to the Fusion models is a no-brainer given the negligible increase in swing weight and good trade-off for paddle stability due to a higher twist weight. The feeling of this paddle face when it comes into contact with a ball is difficult to describe. It's not exactly plush like the feeling you get when hitting a ball with a Yola Hyperion or a Pickleball Apes Pro Line Energy, but it's not a hard or crisp feeling either like the feeling on most 14 millimeter or thinner paddles. There's definitely good vibration dampening in these paddles, so it feels forgiving in that sense. I'd say it kind of feels like a mix between a 16 millimeter thermoform paddle and an EVA foam paddle. So it's very lively, but somehow feels softer than typical raw carbon fiber paddles. The sonic properties of the Gearbox paddles are also unique. They have a lower, more muted sound than typical paddles. They're not as muted as an EVA foam paddle, but again, the sound of the Gearbox Pro Series falls somewhere between kind of EVA and a polypropylene paddle. Although it can take a couple of games to dial in your soft game with these paddles, I found that they are much more controllable than I would have expected given their big power. Softening your grip and using shorter strokes definitely helps with finesse and the soft game but serves, drives, speed ups, and punch volleys are effortless. I found that the best way to tap into the power potential of these paddles is to use a whipping motion on your swing. So instead of using a swing path with a consistent speed, hold your paddle a little longer and then whip through the ball quickly, speeding up as you swing. The first time my mixed doubles partner hit with the Gearbox Pro Power model, 
her drives became legitimately scary. She was coming from the Carbon 1X 14 millimeter and there was a very noticeable difference in power. You'll notice right away if you're playing against someone playing with these paddles, the power models in particular, is that the ball sneaks up on you way faster than expected. I must have missed hit twice as many balls against opponents driving hard with these paddles. You'll also notice your opponents have the same problem when you hit hard balls at them with the pro line. The ball usually gets behind them before they can react, so they either hit it way long or miss hit it into the net. The top tier spin on these paddles is a very welcome addition because you will need it to help dip the balls in with top spin given the extra power and speed that these paddles produce. The handle on both models is long enough for two-handed backhands, which feel very natural. Drives in general just feel great with these things. The response and performance feels a bit closer to a tennis racket than most paddles I've used. Gearbox has always had really well-made paddles, but over the past couple of years, I feel like they fell behind on the power game. They did release power paddles, but none of them compared to the hardest hitting brands out there today. And now with one fell swoop, Gearbox has jumped ahead of everyone else in the power game. Not only that, but the paddles have a great sweet spot and control isn't compromised to the extent that you think it would be. Yes, you can expect pop-ups when you first start playing with these pedals on both the control and the power models, but it doesn't take long to make the adjustments necessary to dial in your control by softening your hands and shortening your stroke. And the top tier spin also helps with control by allowing you to put more shape on the ball. I think these paddles will be very popular. Gearbox sent me four of these and I've had a hard time getting them back from all my friends who've played with them. I've let nearly a dozen people use these things and they've all loved them. I also really enjoy playing with them. The first time I took them to the courts, I had a blast with them, but I wasn't convinced that they were for me. After playing with them for a couple of weeks now though, I'm really enjoying the power model in particular and I'd say that it's probably my number two or three paddle. At this rate, it may become my number one not too far down the road. I don't have any doubt about the construction quality of these paddles. Gearbox's quality control is second to none, and the chance of these paddles breaking or becoming cork corrupted is about as close to zero as you can get. So this brings us back to the price point. At $275, these paddles do not come cheap. That being said, if you have that money and you want one of the best paddles on the market right now, these are absolutely a great choice. I wish I could give you a discount code, but Gearbox doesn't do that. If you do decide to take the plunge though and buy this paddle and this video helped you, please consider using the affiliate link provided in the description below. You don't pay anything more for the paddle when going through the link, but Gearbox sends me a commission which helps out this channel. It helps me with things like paying for the website domain on the new website I just opened, which showcases my paddle database, which a lot of you have been asking for. Go check it out at johnqpickleball.com. The database has all of the metrics that I talk about in my paddle reviews, including spin RPM, swing weight, twist weight, power and pop metrics, and several other things, including some things that I haven't even introduced yet, like surface hardness testing.